This is the Drew Spirience, the show that is 80% combat sports and 20% everything else. This has been in the works for a while. After having uh, Sensei uh, Darren Stringer on, Sensei Wesley Jensen of KRT, I had to get this man on. And he has contributed so much to European Kyokushin, not only as a practitioner, but as a teacher, a human being himself for everyone he's interacted with. His story is straight out of a movie, you can say. It's the story of, of perseverance, taking obstacles by the, by the horns and turning them into opportunities for success. And he is definitely the mod, a model human being for how to be a martial artist and a father. I am very honored to be joined today by Xi'an Felix Tumaza out of the UK. Welcome, Xi'an Felix. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, the, well, you know what the honor is, uh, is the, you know what the honor is, uh, is, it's a big deal. And you know, to have you on I, and to hear your story, I think it's important that I give vo uh, a platform to those who helped as uh, Sensei uh, Patrick Pinto said, by the way, the show is brought to you by Forever the Student, by Sensei Patrick Pinto, picking the greatest minds out of Kyokushin and what gets them to do what they do in their craft. Anyways, back to that. Um, I think it's important to, as, as I was saying, to bring it back is that you, your story is super important because you never know once this episode comes out, how you're going to impact someone that never, that just heard your story and then they message you or they message me and they say, you know, this really helped me or this helped me apply this. So that's why I think it's important. I get these, I get people like yourself on or Renee or Wesley or Darren to come on to give their stories. So I want to hear, you know, let's hear your story because you have quite an interesting story. So the floor is yours. Indeed. <laughs> I have indeed. Well, I was, my parents are politicians. Um, just briefly, my, both my parents are from Cameroon. Uh, my father was part of the party uh, of sort of like the uh, Labour Party, I would say, um, if you were to compare it to the UK. Uh, <clears throat> it was essentially a member of the opposition in Cameroon. Uh, and at the time, uh, because uh, um, the government in place at the time was seeking to subvert uh, 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 the opposition. So my father essentially had to leave the country. Uh, so he left the country and uh, he traveled all around the world. And, but at the time in 1961, I believe in 1960, my father went to Ghana and was working at the time um, for the opposition. Uh, but at the same time, working as an advisor to the then president of Ghana, uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, I was then born. Um, it was my sister, my younger sister, sort of my, sort of my older sister and myself. We were both born in, uh, in Ghana. Uh, but I do have quite a large family as well. So my father uh, was married three times. So we, uh, the, there's, there's quite a few of us. Uh, this entire, so in this entirety, is about seven of us in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, three, uh, sort of like uh, three boys, and the rest are girls. Uh, <clears throat> but yes, and then uh, from Ghana, uh, for political reasons, uh, we had to leave the country, and uh, we ended up in Albania. Just imagine having um, sort of like a black family living in Albania in those days. Uh, from my, from my recollection, I think there were only two black families, and I think there were two black families in the entire country at the time. Uh, so essentially, Albania was the first language I spoke um, until I was probably five and a half. And then from then, for once again, for political reasons, we had to leave Albania and then go to Congo, uh, where they spoke French. Uh, neither of us spoke French. My sister and I, neither of us spoke French. So. Uh, we were considered as probably a little bit outcast to have these three black kids who spoke none of the African languages at all and spoke this weird foreign language, not English or French or, or anything of that sort. So it was Albanian. Uh, 
But yes, so we spent uh, five years in Albania, and then from Albania, once again, for political reasons, we had to go to uh, Algeria and uh, spend five years in Algeria where I learned Arabic. And then from uh, Algeria, uh, my father at the time was here in the UK, and then I came to the UK when I was what, 17, um, yeah, 16, just, just, just over 16, when I came to the UK. So, uh, yeah, from there, um, I, one of my sort of like um, idols in terms of sport were Pele and Muhammad Ali, essentially. So it was the football and, and so sort of Muhammad Ali as, as, as boxing. And uh, <clears throat> so when I came over, I just played football already. I didn't, I didn't do any martial arts. Um, I was looking for a boxing club. Uh, but my father was against, my father is being an academic, so he was like, you can play a little bit of sport at the weekends, but I went to concentrate on studies. Um, and uh, then I, we had a friend of the family who was doing karate, and uh, he asked me whether I would go along with him, and I said, I'm not so sure about karate. I'm, you know, if I had to do any martial arts, more than likely it'd probably be Kung Fu because of Bruce Lee, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I said, nah, I'm not so sure about karate. I think he said, no, 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 this is a different type of karate. I did dabble as a kid in Congo. Uh, we had relatives who were doing Shotokan. Uh, so they did teach me a little bit, but I found it a little bit too rigid for my liking. And I liked the flow of Kung Fu. And I thought, no, no, no I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose something far more realistic. Now, bearing in mind, that I relied entirely on what I was seeing in movies. <laughs> so, um, so I said, I'm not too sure about karate, but I'm going to stick to Kung Fu if I was to do anything. He said, no, no, do come down. You'd be, quite, you'd, be, you'd be surprised as to what you see. So I said, okay, I'll accompany you. And uh, we went to Crystal Palace. Uh, at the time, uh, I think it was late 79, early 80s. It was uh, Hanchi Steve Arnett. Uh, was the teacher. There were about over 200 people training at the same time. And then I was told that I could not join, that if I wanted to join, I had to apply and then wait for a response because so many people wanted to join. So I said, okay. So I sent in the application and then I totally forgot about it. I just continued playing football. And um, then out of the blue, I received a notification that uh, I was accepted to come and train if I wanted to. So I said, okay, I'll give it a go. Um, after the first couple of sessions, I wasn't too impressed, simply because we were right at the back and we couldn't see what the instructors were doing at the front because there were so many of us. So literally, we just had to follow the person that was standing in front of you. So if they were making a mistake, you made the same mistake. <laughs> so there was far too many people at the time. Uh, but uh, after I think it was about a month or so there was a, a sparring session and uh, we were just sparring and, and I got kicked in the head but I didn't see the kick coming in at all so I said to the guy and I said I thought that we were not allowed to use hands he said to me no that wasn't my hand that was my leg and I said that was your leg he said yes and I said no I need to learn some of this you know, and that's where, so for my interest, uh, uh, sort of became even, even greater. And I thought, I want to learn this now. I want to learn this. And um, whatever, sort of apart from school, wherever I could go to a training session anywhere in London, so sort of within my vicinity where I lived in South, sort of in South London, I would go. So there were a couple of clubs in the area. So I would go to Elephant Castle. Uh, and train and the Crystal Palace and uh, we had a club in Peckham. Uh, so wherever I could go uh, and train and sneak in a session, uh, that's where I would go. But uh, my father was against me doing any, any, any form of martial arts. He, he wasn't too impressed uh, me doing it. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I, I just, that's essentially where my sort of karate journey started. It was like Crystal Palace, uh, so sort of, sort of late nine seventy nine, early eighties. What did your father want you to do as a career? Because he was an academic. So, what was the plan in his mind? <laughs> well, 
as, as any father, as, as any academic sort of like father would tell you, just that he wants you to um, concentrate on your academic career and, and hopefully uh, uh, become an academic or some sort yourself. Uh, that, that was the path that, uh, you know, our parents wanted us to do. I mean, we were raised in a political family. Um, whilst I say in all the different countries I stayed in where I stayed, they were not enjoyable stays. And I say, for example, in Congo, we were incarcerated. The whole family was incarcerated for a number of years. I would say probably three, three years. We were incarcerated in Congo uh, because uh, uh, the Cameroonian government at the time wanted my father to return uh, to Cameroon and face the justice system. Uh, so, <clears throat> because my father and my mother didn't live together at the time because he was concerned that if we were to live together, uh, they might arrest the whole family or mm -hmm. kill the whole family. Uh, because, as I said, he survived quite a few assassination attempts. Uh, so, uh, we never lived together. Dad was in different countries, we were in different countries. So, they were trying to pressure him to return to Cameroon by incarcerating his family. Uh, but there was uh, pressure from uh, different nations, uh, mostly sort of socialist countries, uh, not to return us to Cameroon so that my father didn't have to go back. And uh, yeah, so from there, uh, sort of like th those various governments were able to uh, uh, sort of enable us to leave Congo and go to Algeria, which is one of the countries my father had been, had good relations. Uh, with the Algerian government at the time. So, uh, so we were able to leave Congo and go to Algeria and then eventually ended up in, uh, in the UK. Was the government, was that when uh, Boudemien was the head of uh, Algeria before he died? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But even, I even, so uh, <coughs> uh, Harry Boumedien was, was the president at the time where we went. And, uh, and also, we also met um, the last president of Algeria, uh, Mr. Bouteflika who was the foreign, uh, I think it was the foreign secretary at the time when we arrived, in, yes, in Algeria. That's yeah, awesome. so, well, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, um, I mean, we were fortunate in that in Algeria, people spoke French and Arabic, so we could communicate in French, mm -hmm. uh, but, but most people wanted to speak Arabic, so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't relate it because, you know, for me, like, this is like my father's side is from Iran. So just to give share, like what you're telling me, like, it's crazy because the one thing I can say is like, I understand what it's what it's like when a government is like holding is incarcerates because it's not to the level and I can never compare it because it's, it's just two different sides. But my great grandfather on my father's side was under like house arrest during the revolution because. My father's family, they, were, they, they lived under the Shah's era in Iran before they, they left to, they emigrated to Canada in 1965. The other half went to the U.S. into Los Angeles because I don't know why Iranians love Los Angeles, but it's like, <laughs> I guess it kind of better, reminds them. <laughs> yeah, that's why. So my great grandfather uh, had a trucking company. Okay. So it was a big, it was a big company, you know, like I'm pretty sure. It's some of the his clients were like members in the military of the Shah, or he did some business with the Shah, and okay. the, the Ayatollah did not like that. The Ayatollahs did not like that. Any Shah loyalist, if you had assets, you had to give them to uh, to us, and if not, we're gonna obviously, you know, it's it was a very like. There's a reason why my fam, my father's family is very like. They don't really like talking about this side, but you know, after my father passed away in 2014, I started to like pry and understand where. I come from from his side and it just goes it just it's just crazy you know like how like people don't really understand like what they see on the news like and they think oh yeah you know this and this but then when they you hear someone like your story or like what i'm about to say like the ayatollahs are not good people there's a reason why like there's like these sanctions on this country because they are a very draconian government they do not like opposition my great grandfather could have been, for all I know, could have been under house arrest for life, or they could have executed him because they could have said like, he's a he's a he's a traitor because he oh, he was a Shah loyalist. My grand grandfather had no loyalties to the Shah or any government. He was just a businessman that yeah. wanted to live his life, and I think that's why when we got him out of there, like it's I, I see the parallel in a sense. When we got him out of there, it was like it was it, it's very angst. Like I mean, I have. 
like my my grandmother and her and her like my my, my grandmother and her her brother like who I never met unfortunately like her brother like it was a very stressful time to get to get to get out, like family members out of these like hot these like turbulent countries yeah 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 no, I mean I say we were, we were I mean I have to say we were so sort of fortunate enough um <clears throat> that so sort of, in latter years um so we were able to go back uh to cameroon and, and see our country for the first time i think my first my first visit to cameroon was probably sometime in the early so early 2000 i was able to go back and, and so was my father and um <clears throat> my father died about 10 years ago and uh, so sort of he received a state funeral uh in cameroon so he was uh, he was buried in cameroon uh, he died here in the uk but we took him back to Cameroon and the current sort of Cameroonian government um, recognized his contribution to the country and afforded him uh, a state burial uh, in the country. So uh, proud of that, you know, so on his behalf, because as I said, he dedicated his life to the cause and, uh, and it was a just deserved really for uh, what really, the government did. He really did help a lot of people from uh, what you were telling me, like, like the common Cameroonian. Yeah, I mean, you know, even even now, there's there's there's, there's struggles between the French-speaking Cameroon and the English-speaking Cameroon. So that's, uh, but <clears throat> that's 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 more of a division of language as opposed to uh, the main reasons why you know people are unhappy. It's, it's, it's more of a deep-rooted issue than you know just people speak French and people speak English. So, uh, uh, but so yeah. You know, that's that's more so the the political size, uh, sort of in brief terms, uh, of sort of my journey from, you know, having been born in Accra in Ghana to uh, making it to London, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that's essentially that's how uh, I found Kyokushin. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was it was hard in the sense that, um, as I said, I didn't have that family support in terms of the sports and activity that I wanted to do um, against the academic sort of academic uh, sort of like lifestyle my father uh, uh, wanted for us and sort of like combining the two wasn't easy uh, when you don't have that support uh, but uh, you know uh, sometimes when you want something uh, badly um, you just have to fight for it and and go for it and um, and yes then the journey has been you know you have your ups and downs but all in all i wouldn't change a damn thing about it so yeah yeah it's awesome so, that is awesome and now you said you didn't really have the fami the family support from your father because you know what was going on in your life what role did hanshi arneel play in your life when you when you started getting good at kyokushin when you started gaining some peer support and forming bonds and friendships that would really help you propel hanshi's been instrumental i mean i've been at crystal palace sports center hanshi's been teaching there uh, you know i think it was probably um, probably like late, late 60s, I started teaching at Crystal Palace. Um, and so as I say, I joined late 70s. Uh, so he was already a legend at Crystal Palace. And um, yeah, he's taught me all my life. Uh, and, you know, taught me uh, and I became an instructor with him. Uh, and uh, yeah, and it's, it's been it's been instrumental uh, in, in sort of in my life, you know, for well, over 40 years now. So, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's played a huge role in, in my life it's, uh, in terms of martial arts. Uh, but in, in the same process, he also had a couple of other instructors that also taught uh, with him in those days, uh, Sensei Joe Borg and, uh, and she and Jeff Weibrow as well. And so there were sort of the additional instructors at Crystal Palace and all three of them, sort of Hanshi, Jeff and, and um, Joe Borg played huge part huge part in my in my karate life encouraging me uh, uh supporting me and uh, and yeah essentially making making me the martial artist that i'm today um uh, so yeah they can't thank them enough for you know for what they've done certainly that's that's amazing now you became an instructor can you tell me 
when a little lad by the name of Darren Stringer came under your tutelage? How did that happen? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I think it was, I think it was something about, I think six years old, or six or seven <laughs> years old, uh, coming to Crystal Palace and his parents dropping him off and watching him from the stands training and uh, always sort of that demonstrated sort of like this, this youthful and sort of enthusiasm you know, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, yeah, we can say now that you can see potential, but there's a lot of kids that start karate. You can see potential, but very few carry it out. Very few continue in the sport, and um, and I'm certainly not surprised what he has achieved because he's is um, an extremely dedicated individual, and uh, and when you apply yourself to something then you reap the rewards and uh, kudos to Darren. That's is certainly what he's done. And, and, and the same applies for Wesley. You know, they're, they're, they love the sport, they enjoy it, they practice it on a daily basis, come what may. And uh, hey, you just got to hold your hands up and say, good on you guys, you know, keep it Jared, up. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy I can, I'm, I'm so, it's so privileged to say that I know them. And you know, even though we're on the other side of the pond where I'm in Canada and they're in Europe, it's like we, we speak the same language of martial arts and I, and I would go to battle for those two any day to promote KRT, Karate Tips and Tricks, uh, Wesley's Dojo, Darren's Dojo. Like these guys are like, they're such examples of what Kyokushin is. And I really think that you are someone that deserves the credit for that because you really helped them. And I really want people to know that like, you know, you, you've really played a significant role, not only in those two individuals lives, but every other, cause you never know Felix. Like, I mean, have you ever had like, what means the most to you about becoming an instructor and then like reaping the, seeing what you've helped create, what has been the most rewarding for you? The teaching and seeing, teaching the kids and seeing them grow. I had uh, uh, like a wonderful experience, <laughs> probably a comical experience. I was walking down the street and, and I, I walked rather slow. And this car just stopped in the middle of the road. And the lady wound the window down and she said, Felix, are you okay? And I looked at her and I wouldn't recognize it at all. And I said, of course I'm fine, why? But she said, but you're walking rather slowly. And I said, Yes, and she goes, well, you won't remember me, but you taught me karate 25 years ago. Wow. And I thought, wow, 25 years ago. And she goes, yes, you taught me 25 years ago, and you always used to be nimble on, on your feet. So I said, well, I walk slow to conserve energy, so I'm nimble when I'm fighting. <laughs> 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 you know, but that, that is the greatest joy, really, is, is, is to see uh, the generation uh, of, of, of students and fighters that you helped mentor and um, whether they've kept on um, doing martial arts or gone on to achieve other things in their life that is the greatest gift that is the, the greatest enjoyment one can have really i have something to show you and this is gonna make you this is some this is gonna make you laugh like i, I i'm not good with technology putting stuff on here but i have it on my phone <laughs> So I'm only good at turning on a computer, maybe searching videos on YouTube, sending them to you. So let me get this. Let me get good. That's why. That's why we're friends. Okay. So here's a good photo. Okay. So uh, Wesley sent me this, and maybe you remember this photo. <laughs> I think. I think. I think I was signing uh, one of the Croati magazines, and I was signing his Croati magazine. <laughs> do you age that, like, that, do you, that clearly shows how old I am now I do you like, age because you still look the same like what is your what is your <laughs> secret like what are you like it's like I'm like Wesley's like I'm like and like I asked them Wesley and Darren I'm like does this man age does he age and they're like no they're like Felix <laughs> yeah. Felix okay. Felix is Felix is an uh, an outlier. <laughs> I walk even slower now than I used to, <laughs> so I need to conserve even more of so like more energy than I used to in the past. Uh, yeah, but as I say, in terms of those two, they they they've sort of like you know uh, exceeded anybody's expectations really because, as I said, you. Not, 
when you teach, you see so many kids and, and so many people that you teach. And then you may see the potential, but very, very few uh, will continue onto that path. And for, for various reasons, you know, uh, it could be family reasons, health reasons, and whatever else. But, uh, but to see those two grow, uh, it's just been an incredible journey to watch them achieve what they have achieved. And uh, long may it continue, really. Yeah, it's been yeah, a wonderful no, journey for them. Some other people I wanted to give a shout out to when I said you're coming on the show, Tom Cunnington from oh, Roman yes. Dojo. Yes, the Tom, yeah, yeah, trained with me as well. And so I've said fantastic things about you, Terry Burkett. And he, when I Terry, got, yeah. Terry, when I told him, he's like, oh my, he's like, you have to tell Felix I say hi. I, I hope he's doing well. This is great that he's coming on. So he says hi. Um, I think those are the only two. There might be a few others if I can't, because like, I can't, I, I, my bandwidth in my brain can only remember so many names. Like, I have a good memory. I have a good memory. It's the perk of kind of being mildly on the autism spectrum because, yeah. you know, I have a good photographic memory, but there's some names I'm just like, Ugh, and I give them names. So I'll be like, uh, hi, Carl, or hi, <laughs> Jen. You yeah, look like a yeah. Jenner, Carl, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so, you know, you are, so, you know, let's talk about your competition period. So when you came up, you know, you become, when you were competing, you know, it's very important to know, you know, it's a very high praise. And I don't throw this compliment lightly unless, like, you know, people tell me how accomplished you are. And, you know, John Jones is our favorite fighter. We've spoken off the record yeah, about yes, that. Yes, we have indeed, yeah. And I, I would have to say, you know, you are the John Jones of, of Kyokushin in your generation and era because of what you've accomplished. What, what was it like? Tell me, what was it like when you first competed? Let's talk about your first ever Kumite and what, and what you remember from it. Oh, my goodness me. The first tournament I fought in, and I, 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 was, um, I was a yellow belt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Crystal Palace. <clears throat> I think it was uh, a Friday. We had a Friday session, and the next day there was the British Open, and then we had the grading on the Tuesday before, and then on Friday, Hanchi announced that I passed and that I'm now a green belt. Because in order to fight in knockdown tournaments in those days, you had to be a green belt or above. So on the Friday, he said to me, he said to me, "Congratulations, you're now a green belt. Do you want to fight tomorrow?" And I said. Tomorrow? I said, of course I'll fight tomorrow. No problem at all. And <laughs> I'd never fought knockdown. I mean, it was actually a spot in the dojo, but never fought uh, sorry, in the tournament. But I thought I was of the mindset that, of course, if I, you know, if I were to hit somebody really hard, I'm pretty sure they're going to get hurt. So um, the next day, I said, yes, of course I'll fight. So the next day, I fought in the British Open. I think it was 1982 or 1981. No, 1982, I think it was. Uh, British Open. And I got my head kicked in, I must say, about, I don't know, about 20 times. This guy was just playing ping pong with my head. You know, he had too many tricks for me to cope with. As I said, I hadn't trained for the tournament, but it was just sheer gut so I was said, I'm not going down and I'm going to fight until I drop. And, and I fought him for six minutes. But after about two minutes, I was absolutely exhausted. And then the referee uh, at the time was, I think it was Sheehan uh, Brown Fitkin. And Sheehan Brown Fitkin came to me and said, right, the fight is a draw. You're going to fight two more minutes. I said, Sheehan, I can't fight anymore. I'm absolutely tired. He said, well, you can go down if you want. It's entirely up to you. Right. But you got other two minutes. If you're tired, go down and you give the fight to the other person. I say, I'm not going down. Absolutely not. All my friends watching, I'm not doing that. So we fought for further for uh, two minutes. And then after that, it was a draw again. And then, you know, he got on the scales and he came back, came back again, and they put an extra two minutes. And eventually, uh, the other chap won. Um, I was on soup. I couldn't open my jaw. I got kicked so many times in my face uh, that I was, I, was, I was on soup for about a month, I think. You know, I couldn't open my jaw <laughs> for a while. What did your but dad that, think? But, oh, gosh. My dad just, just saying, uh, this is the reason why I wanted <laughs> to concentrate. So that even emboldened him even more to say, leave that stuff, you know. Uh, 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 and, and just concentrate uh, in your books. But 
that made me even more angry. The fact that I got kicked in the head so many times uh, and that I said, right, I need to start training properly. I need to get my own back. And, uh, and that's, I would say, probably when I became a green belt, and I think that's, that's when the proper training started. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, I had uh, a few successes, both, you know, the fight in, in, uh, in the UK, the regional tournaments, and then eventually going on to, um, I think the first European championship that I fought in was, uh, they called it like a junior European, it was in France. And my first fight was against uh, Johnny Klein um, uh, from from Holland, uh, who was also I think was also uh, uh, sorry, a K three uh, sorry K one a K one fighter as well. Uh, tremendous tremendous chap. And um, now we're both <clears throat> trying sort of like to come up the ladder. And I fought him in France. Uh, um, yeah, it was, it was, I think it was my first or second fight in France. So I did well in that tournament in France. And, uh, and then, yeah, things just went from then on. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. That's awesome. So when you, so then we move, you sent me some photos. I believe they're from the 1987 Cup, right? Where you're shaking. No, that was, uh, that was 1991 World Championship in Japan. Oh, okay. There, yeah, that was a very yeah. interesting tournament because there were some, there was some controversy, as we know, um, <clears throat> even for the Canadian fighters. I mean, I'm sure. Jean Rivier, said, yeah, I mentioned Jean before, before yeah. the tournament. Yeah, so we were, we were essentially staying in the same, so in the same must, place. So. So you must have known or heard about not only Jean Riviere, but Reynald Lamar, uh, Reynald Lamar yeah, yeah. Pierre Cataford, Alain Bonami, those guys. Alain Bonami, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, because we, we, we were essentially staying in different, uh, so like in, in, in one hotel, I think in different hotels originally. And then after the first day of fighting, they moved us from our hotel and everybody had to go and stay in the... Um, I think it was a former uh, hall. Uh, it was a sports hall, uh, which hadn't been used uh, for many, many years in, in, uh, in Japan. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of, of the sports hall. But it's quite a famous sports hall because I think it was used um, uh, for the Olympics, I think in the 70s or 80s or something uh, or another. So all the foreign fighters had to go and stay there and it, and it wasn't pleasant because uh, <clears throat> we fought on the first day, we fought on the first day and then after we came back from the tournament and this was like around about seven eight o'clock at night and then we were told to vacate the uh, the hotel and I always had to leave and go to uh, uh, Yoyoji I think it was Yoyoji Hall or Yoyoji Sports Center and go and stay there and then we had to queue for our blankets. We had to queue for our bed sheets, and you know. And we and by the time we went to bed for to fight the next day, you know, some of us were absolutely exhausted already. Uh, so yeah, so this um, I met Filio, um, Jean Rivière, and all the guys. We all met up because uh, I think we had we had a, like a communal pool. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's good times. Was Andy Hug in there too? Even. Andy, Andy, as well as, as that, but uh, um, Andy's also sort of like uh, uh, a friend because uh, Andy was training a lot with a close friend of mine, uh, Michael Thompson. Uh, Michael, I used to live about two minutes away from me, so we used to train together quite quite often. And uh, one of Michael started his K1 career. Uh, he would train with Andy, and he would also go and teach uh, for Andy in uh, in Switzerland, in Lucerne, uh, where Andy had his dojo. And then when both would go and fight in Japan, and I would occasionally go and teach uh, for Andy in, in Lucerne, just keep the dojo going whilst he was away fighting. So, um, yeah, Andy helped me a lot. Uh, introduced me to uh, uh, the Sado uh, tournaments. Uh, took me to the Sado tournament in uh, in Germany, in Berlin, uh, 
and um, yeah, met him as well. We stayed so in the same household uh, when I went to fight in the Sailor World Tournament in Japan. Uh, I think it was the '95, the '95 mm -hmm. Sailor World Tournament. Uh, but I think Andy won the, I think he won the '94, uh, and uh, did he win the '94? No, I think Andy won the '93. Sam won the '94. Yeah. Uh, Sam Greco won the 94, and I think I fought in the 95. And then there was, uh, there's even Michael Bernardo in there, another Ki South yeah. African Kyokushin. That, his, yeah, story is, yeah. his story is sad, though. Like, I mean, like, it, it's really tragic because, like, when you hear, like, why he got into Kyokushin, because he was really bullied, and then he became successful, and then he became, like, uh, like he started using his, his like, platform to, to teach at-risk youth, and then eventually he just, tragically passed away it passed was away. Like, yeah yeah S sad, sad to hear it was sad to hear when mike died yeah so he was, was. A, um, such a good fighter yeah oh yeah gosh yeah yeah tremendous fighter tremendous fighter and 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 a similar thing could be said for um for um um andy hug you know mm -hmm. what a legend on the sport the sport and i remember in japan you now we would go out and uh, you know, uh, we were going to a restaurant or, or a bar and they were saying, oh, you with Andy, you don't have to pay anything whatsoever at all. So, yeah. And I <clears throat> I even fell in love. Andy used to drive in Switzerland. He had a Lexus. Uh, that was the first Lexus of the LS, uh, the 400 car that I've been into. And it was just like, it was like a mini plane. And uh, yeah, since then I thought to myself, that's the car I want. That's the car I want. <laughs> what, what was he like as a person? Because, like, I mean, like, everyone always, like, there's, like, this, like, legend to him. But, like, everyone says, like, just so quiet, very humble. Like, never let the fame get to him. Andy, Andy was ever so humble. Never forgot where he came from. Uh, always had time for anybody. Uh, success never went to his head, never considered himself above anyone whatsoever at all. Uh, and um, always prepared and ready to give, you know, um, anybody a hand. Um, so yeah, he was, he was, he was an amazing individual and uh, it was awfully sad that he passed away at such a young age because he had so much to offer really. I think he was just really starting to like get like, I mean, look, he was in his mid thirties at that point, but I think he was preparing. Well, how I look at Andy Hug is guy came from nothing, you know, parents were broke like his grandparents had to raise him he became a successful yeah. footballer but then the grandparent his grandfather said listen he's like i can't afford both andy you got to pick one is it kyokushin or is it going to be yeah. soccer or football and he chose kyokushin and then look what happens and then you know when he was about to leave in 2000 when the new millennium came i think he i think if he would have lived i think we would have seen kyokushin raised to a new level with k1 oh, absolutely no doubt, no doubt whatsoever at all. As I said, he, he never forgot his beginning. I mean, I've, as I said, now we've got so many different Kyokushin styles, but it doesn't matter what styles, it doesn't matter what groups you belong to. We're all Kyokushin. We're all doing the same thing. There is no change. And the analogy I used to people, I said, well, when you leave school, you go to university. And after you finish university, do you all have the same jobs? No, you don't. But the, the education you received is from the same university. We all went to the same uni, but it just so happens that we're now working for different companies. But the education that we received was from that particular university. And the same thing applies to Kyokushin. Too many people sometimes refer to, oh, well, I belong to this particular organization, or I belong to that organization. It doesn't matter what organization you belong to. You know, the main question is, what are you doing? What are you practicing? Uh, and you're practicing Kyokushin. So, even those who say, oh, well, I do Ashihara. Well, what is Ashihara? It's you an know? offshoot. You know, it's, it's just an offshoot of Kyokushin. But it's not even an offshoot. It, it is Kyokushin. Uh, Seido, what's Seido? I said, it's Kyokushin. So, um, you know, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we all Kyokushin. And, uh, and as I say, our doors should be open to anybody who wants to uh, practice the art type of thing and uh, sort of the idea that uh, <clears throat> that I belong to a specific organization um, doesn't sit well with me. Me neither. I, I, there's no borders. There's no, I mean, like, that's why I do this podcast. Like, I mean, I've had like some people say, not some, I had like one or two that say, I don't really want to come on your show because my organ, and I said, well, like I said, I'm not trying to get you to sign to the organization. I'm just trying to pick your brain. I said, be your own person. 
And, you Absolutely. know, it's, that's what I do the show for. Like, that's why Patrick Pinto does his show, too. Like, he's not trying to get people to come to his organization in Australia. He's trying to get people to just pick the brains and just expose and raise the artist so so I wanted yeah absolutely absolutely and um, as, you know, as you as you rightly point out we are we are all so slash students you know ultimately uh, so yeah I don't I don't I don't sort of like put labels on people or from which organization they belong to um, Kyokushin is Kyokushin you know you can call it whatever you want to call it but um, yeah that's, mm-hmm. that's that's my mm-hmm. analogy Whatever happened to Michael Thompson? Because he was a star. Like he was the black, like the Black Panther. Like he had a the way I've watched his fights. Guys, of <sighs> machine. Like he was a machine, and he had that famous fight with Matsui. And to bring it to five extensions with Matsui is it something in itself? Whatever happened with uh, Michael? Michael is around. Um, I speak to him like. Um, not so much on a daily basis, but we communicate through WhatsApp. Uh, in most days, uh, he's fine. He lives in Ireland now. Uh, he, he works in Ireland. Uh, he works for uh, the Leinster rugby team, which is a famous uh, rugby team in Ireland. Uh, he's the uh, senior masseur for the team. And uh, yes, he's, he's very happy. He doesn't, he doesn't do karate anymore. Uh, he's into uh, he's cycling and, and hiking. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's well. What a tremendous fight for for a man, sort of, you know, f- for his stature, uh, a small person uh, um, like him uh, to achieve what he has achieved. Uh, similar to uh, Shia Nick Da Costa, you know, uh, guys with very very small stature, uh, statures, uh, and what they have achieved in in sort of like at world level. It was truly, truly, truly remarkable uh, for guys so small, really. That's awesome. Yeah, and you and you, like you like you are like a primary source because you've been there, you've been, you've seen everything happen before you, and that's why I love doing the show because people need to understand we can hear the stories from others, but they hear it from the primary person themselves, like a Cameron Quinn or uh, Hanshi John Taylor. I don't know, I don't know John Taylor, but obviously I know of Cameron Quinn. Yeah, yeah. I know John Taylor's done a lot. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have to just look up, do my research. So for yeah. anyone who's under his organization, please do not criticize me. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to learn. You know, I'm learning new stuff every day. We, we all came from the same group. John, yeah. Cameron, Queen, all of us, um, you know, part of the same organization. But as I said, you know, um, you know, you go to the same school. And then after that, for whatever reason, uh, you may elect to branch out and do your own thing. But the knowledge uh, that you've acquired comes from the same source. So, um, yeah, good luck to them. And, uh, and they've all participated in, in, in making Kyokushin to what it is. So uh, kudos to them. Yeah, yeah oh, exactly. I got it. We have to give credit where it's due. Now, Absolutely. one of your other competitions was, okay, I'm going to be careful with my wording here because I don't, because everyone, there's, there's a lot of people who are fans of this fighter for his style. You fought Semi Schilt. That was like, wow. Like, and I want to hear this story. So what was that like fighting <laughs> Semi? <laughs> Semi was the, like, the, at once, before I say anything, it, what an amazing guy. I mean, yeah. Semi, it was, uh, he hasn't changed from, as I said, from, so like, you know, when we first fought, I can't remember the year we first fought, but he, he was a green belt. And, and, you know, by then I was already uh, a, sort of like a known fighter. Uh, but just his sheer size, the Dutch, all the Dutch, you know, people like uh, the Gordo brothers, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, Johnny Klein, who was another one, uh, Michael Waddell, Michelle Waddell, uh, was another one. They're all so tall and, and big, but Semi was even bigger. And I remember uh, with Michael, we used to say, how do these guys become so big? You know, so we thought, I know how, they eat a lot of cheese because they're Dutch. So uh, I'm not too much of a cheese lover, but <laughs> I started buying cheese because I thought, I want to be as big as these guys. And I'm, to the point where I remember Michael and I were too scared to, ch- to get changed in the same locker room as the Dutch fighters, because if they saw our size, because you know when you put a gear on, it makes it look bigger than you actually are. But if they saw us without our gears on, 
they would have killed us. So we thought, we're not going to change in front of them. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Semi, Semi uh, was, he, he's such a humble guy. I mean, as I said, we, we met on, on numerous occasions and uh, his successes in K1, uh, he's, 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 he hasn't changed one bit at all. He's just, he remained as humble. And even within Ashihara, I see him still teaching the kids, supporting the kids. Uh, and uh, yeah, what an amazing guy, what an amazing guy. Uh, I think we fought twice or three times uh, with Semi. But as I say, I was uh, more experienced than he was. I knew he was just too big for me to try and knock him out. Uh, but <clears throat> as I said, Muhammad Ali was my idol, so feet movement. Uh, uh, are very important to me, you know, the ability to to make the other person miss and move out of situations. Uh, so he relied entirely uh, on his power, uh, and uh, but I frustrated him by just making him, by, by, you know, by making him miss. Yeah, and 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 uh, and yeah, as I say, he, he was younger, he was bigger, but he was younger, and uh, and that frustrated him. So. Uh, any plans that he had uh, in his mind to fight me uh, went out the window because I, I, I played more with his mind and, uh, and, and he was struggling to catch me and so forth. And I remember also having a conversation with his dad and his father was saying, my son will beat you one day. He will beat you. He will beat you. And I said to him, he has no chance whatsoever at all. <laughs> just, just, just teasing his dad. And yeah. then I said, he has no chance of beating me. And... Uh, and I think we fought again, uh, and I beat him again. And his father said, he will beat you one day. And then I hadn't seen Semi for, uh, for quite some time. He became sort of K1 legend. And then, we, and then we met again, and his father said, right, Felix, now my son will beat you. I said, uh, I think you're mistaken. The Felix that you were talking about, it's not me. I'm his twin brother. Uh, the other one is, uh, I don't know where it is. My twin brother, I don't know where it is. He says, no, 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 it's you. I said, no, 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 it's not me. <laughs> Looking at the size of Sammy's hands and feet, and I thought, no. When I was younger, I would, I would fight him. But now, I said, I don't think so. You know? uh, but yeah, he's, he's an amazing guy, an amazing guy. And uh, yeah, it was great fun to fight him. He's you know he's really done a lot for uh, not only Ashihara or Kyokushin K1, but he even fought in the UFC in the early days too. In the early yes, Tuesday indeed, yeah, yeah. And so did um, the, the, so did Gerard Gordo as well. Gerard Gordo is the the most. I you know what I I always tell people. Okay, I say stop looking at Hoist Gracie. I get it. He won, but the first ever fight that happened in the cage on November twelfth, nineteen ninety three, was. Kyokushin practitioner went under Savat, Gerard Gordo, and he fought Taylor Tuli, the sumo wrestler. Yeah, Taylor Tuli. Yeah, yeah. Fought um, Kevin. Fought like the big guy. He's like he was like an American kickboxer, but he was like he was like I'm an like I'm an ISKA champion. And but like <laughs> but the guy looked like he was the champion of eating buffalo wings all the time from Buffalo, New York. Because I remember he was from. Uh, Kevin Rosier, I think that's it. Kevin Rosier, yeah, he fought Kevin Rosier, and uh, he just starched Kevin like he just beat down Kevin. It was like it was it was it was pretty sad to watch that fight. But Gerard is is the most important. I think Gerard is one of the most important and often forgot about figures in oh, UFC yes. history. Yes, indeed. I mean, I, I fought Gerard in the British Open. Uh, <clears throat> I lost on a decision to him. And um, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, both him and his brother, incredible fighters, you know, you can't take away from him. As I said, Charles said, they're not just Kyokushin, but, you know, the K1s and, uh, uh, no, 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 not the K1. I mean, the, the you know, sort of, they are sort of the original fighters, really, I would say, of, um, of the ultimate, so of the UFC, you know, in those days. And, and I think after he lost to Gracie, and I think he asked for a rematch, but Gracie wouldn't grant him a rematch. No. He said, gonna, uh, yeah, he said, I want to fight him again. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, uh, today they remain, you know, good friends. Uh, you know, when I do go to Holland, I, I do see them. So yeah, great guys. Yeah, like I definitely have been wanting to get in touch with Nico. Like, uh, like I know there's a way, like Gerard is a bit more 
off the grid because he doesn't like he likes to kind of like it, it's it's kind of funny like how like the, the brothers are like they're like this apparently nico's the more talkative one that will be be able to go on and gerard will just give you one word answers because he likes to just <laughs> he's more of an i like to get to know you in person not on a screen or on a phone yeah. but i've heard such good stories about gerard like one time like uh, he was at a dinner. He was at a dinner. Darren told the story. There was like all these big names there. Gerard shows up in a track suit and a jeans. And he's like, he's like, I don't care if people don't know who I am or they know who I am. He's like, I'm me. I have my family. I have my brother. I have my school, my students. That's what I care about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I said, he's remained like that um, to date. Yeah. An incredible guy. Both of them. Both of them. Um, yeah. They are super important, especially for Hall and Kyokushin. And uh, there's that's that their contributions, like that's why I want to bring it up because, like, I really want people to understand, like, it wasn't before the John Jones, before Habib, before Anderson, George St. Pierre, Connor, there was Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, and before that, there was Ken Shamrock, Hoyce Gracie and Gerard Gerdeau, whether you love him or hate him, yeah, he will yeah. always be in a, a part. The Gerdeau brothers it's, have to be in there. I mean, as I said, I mean, in, in terms of the Kyokushin folklore in, in, in Holland, uh, um, you know, you, you got, as I said, uh, uh, Michel Waddell, and as I said, the, the two Gordo brothers, you know, uh, Nico and Gerard. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can't take, and, 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 um, uh, Peter Smith, who died, uh, that they, they are sort of like part of the huge Kyokushin folklore of 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 of, of, you know, of world Kyokushin, really, not just Dutch Kyokushin and European Kyokushin, but world Kyokushin. Uh, amazing individuals and incredible fighters, and all of them. So yeah, very true. Um... The other, now, Darren was telling me about one significant tournament. This was the 1991 British Open at Crystal Palace. Like, apparently, it was a sold-out house. They wanted to see you fight. Do you remember that tournament? Darren, if I got the date wrong, I'm sorry. But this was like, he was telling me, like, you have to ask Felix about this one tournament. Like, he went on this one run where people just couldn't stand with him. It's like, it's like people, it's like, you, it's like they were here, you were up here, basically. You know, you know. Sometimes, uh, as a fighter, there's been uh, tournaments where I've I felt that I'm going to go down there and I'm going to win. Because that's how I felt in myself, and I go down there and I lose. <laughs> and then there's been tournaments when you go down there and you think, "Wow!" And you look at you draw and you think, "This is going to be tough." Uh, but sometimes everything just clicks. And I think the tournament is referring to, and I think it's a tournament, I can't remember what year it was, but I remember fighting, I think from, from my first fight to the final were all Russian fighters. And, and, and the Russians were making their mark uh, in sort of like, you know, in, in, in world Kyokushin uh, in those days. And, uh, and my draw just so happened to have uh, these Russian fighters in my draw. And... Uh, and I was able to beat every single one of them, um, to their surprise. But I was able to do that by changing tactics uh, <clears throat> for every single fight that I fought. And I think, I think Michael, I think Michael was coaching me for for, for that tournament, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, and as I said, sometimes things just work for you. Uh, I try to rely more on timing than than power. Um, you know, trying to make your opponent miss and then hit them back or sweep them. Uh, I, I like sweeping, but I like sweeping because of the, it's, it's the timing. Uh, so when your opponent misses a particular technique, then you're able to take them down. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I've had some amazing memories at Crystal Palace, you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's where I teach to this day at Crystal Palace. It's only about 10 minutes away from where I live. Uh, and I've had some tremendous memories of Crystal Palace uh, yeah, fighting there. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was just one of those years where things just fell to place and uh, able to defeat an individual. But it's not so much the, like winning the tournament. Uh, it's partaking, taking part in the tournament uh, and also seeing that your techniques do work. Uh, for me, it's far more important they're actually lifting the trophy. 
uh, because you can win a trophy, you can win a tournament, and not necessarily fighting well. Uh, because it could be a case of where you're fighting an opponent who's injured, or an opponent who slips and you catch him as he's going down. Uh, but when you fight and you're able to sort of like counteract your opponent's techniques and catch him, um, that gives me a greater joy than you know, lifting the trophy at the end. Uh, so when things do work, you set him up for a particular technique and you catch him with it, uh, whether it's a punch or a kick or a spinning kick or whatever the case may be, uh, yeah, that, that gives me greater satisfaction that that particular technique actually works because sometimes people teach techniques or ask students to perform things that they know that their student won't be capable of doing so against that particular opponent. Uh, so having the same combination for every fight that you fight, you will struggle. Uh, a son of a good fighter is a, it's, it's just your ability to change and be able to accommodate whoever you're fighting at the time. You know, if you're fighting somebody who's got fast reaction, why are you gonna try and kick them in the head? Because when you're trying to kick to the head, for example, you expose yourself when you miss. So if you know that that's the case, then you've got to change your tactics. Uh, so technique is far more important for me than, you know, someone who's got tremendous power. So that's the reason why I like Mr. John Jones. You know, the, the variety of techniques that he brings to the table is just incredible, you know. Uh, love or hate him, you have to admire his craft, you know, you know what he does and his timing. Uh, so he's just incredible. So, yeah. I love, like, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, I mean, I like him too now because he's more of a bad guy. Like, he's embracing <laughs> the bad boy role. And now I'm a Christian. I love the case. So recently, uh, recently, it was like the five or six year anniversary of his first fight with DC. And he posted a photo where DC's like on the, on like on the corner and John puts his hand on him. And he's like, I put my hand on you. Like you were my bitch. And it was like, wow. It's like, that just goes to shit. And everyone's like, everyone's like, Oh, fuck, John Jones is so listen. You know what? I hate to say it. And you know, I don't hate to say it, but you know what? Daniel Cormier is not, up there with the goats he didn't beat john jones did he have a good run at light heavyweight yes but you have to beat john and he didn't beat him in two times at heavyweight i think daniel cormier is the best but at light heavyweight you can't take the king's crown i mean john is the king of the is the is the king of that division right oh yeah there's 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 no doubt zero doubt about that i mean he's he he is the goat uh you know uh for what he has achieved, and yes, people like probably uh, uh, what's his name, the uh, the flyweight chap, uh, Demetrius Johnson. Dem Demetrius Johnson. Uh, between Demetrius Johnson and John Jones, uh, they're the two. You know, I know GSP has done extremely well, but GSP lost, uh, and and you know, number one, you're gonna go for John Jones, and then probably Demetrius Johnson, and then uh, then Apu, Apu Khabib after that. You know, in terms of, of uh, um, you know, people who have that sort of like, uh, like an arsenal of, 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 of techniques in, in, in their bag, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, you can't, you, you, you can't, you know, say love or hate him, you know, they're the guys, they're the guys. And they're, they've proven it, you know, not so many times. So uh, you, you can't take it away. And, and I think people should judge sports people on the basis of what they do in their sporting field. Um, you know, to judge somebody and what he does outside, we all have, you know, issues. We all have frailties. We all have uh, um, sort of like, uh, um, you know, just, just not all of us deal with situations the same way. Uh, so, you know, if you reacted that way you know in a restaurant against somebody or you know he, he said something uh, to someone on the street and the people would try and say well you know he's not a great fighter because of that but no you know we admire him because he's a good fighter uh, you know very few of us are not john jones personally we don't know you know uh, uh even so that 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 closely but 
in terms of what he's achieving on the field, we can all see. Him. So let's judge him based on what he's doing in his field as opposed to, you know, his other activities outside the sphere of sport, you know. So, yeah, kudos to them. It's 10 years that when they made, when he beat Ryan Bader, and then when they said, do you want to fight for the light heavyweight championship? Because uh, Rashad Evans has been injured. And he, and John goes, like, famously, like, in tears, yes, give me Shogun. And it was like, that was like the Trevor Biebrick of Mike Tyson for MMA when you <laughs> yeah. think of it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, what happened to Trevor Burbick? Well, he died, apparently. He died. I mean, was, was he shot in Jamaica? Or something? Yeah, he was murdered by his nephew, apparently. It was oh, really yes. tragic, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. Uh, it's just sad because, like, Trevor Bierbeck, like, was a heavyweight champion, you know, and then, you know, like, regardless of whether he won or lost, I mean, in boxing, I'm not as well versed in boxing as I am with MMA, but I do know yeah. – some basics and Trevor Bierbeck was tragically killed in 2006 in like a land dispute apparently with like his nephew and but to equate that with John Jones it's because like in terms of Mike Tyson because John Jones I believe is the Mike Tyson of mixed martial arts with the complexity he's a very complex person but I think he's a very misunderstood person like Tyson is. yes indeed as I said you know yeah. Very few of us know him so sort of like, you know, not the real John Jones. And, and as I said, so in order for us to judge him, we can only judge him on what he does in the sporting sphere. So we can't judge him on any other issues. You know, people will say little bits and pieces about him in newspapers and stories and so forth. But that is not for us to judge. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're not John Jones as a martial artist, as, you know, the goat in, in, in the light heavyweights. Uh, let's judge him for what he does on yeah. so in the octagon. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for him to fight Israel Adesanya. I mean, I like Izzy too. You know, he's done very I well. Can't, I can't. I can't see that fight happening. Really, I can't. I can't really see it happening because I don't think. Uh, Easy, we want to go up to heavyweights. I'm not. I'm not so sure. I think if he does, that's going to be later on in his career, and I think by then, uh, Jones will have retired or have been too old. But uh, I, you know, I just can't see Easy trying to go for the heavyweight uh, now. And uh, I think if he does, I think I think he'll get hurt. Oh yeah, it's like because one thing too is the one thing too that like I like Izzy. But I mean, there's a difference between like, I think there's a difference between guys like Kamaru, him, and Francis Naganu. Like Kamaru and Francis are very humble. They have like that upbringing where they're very like they keep to themselves. They only talk if they really have to. But Izzy is not afraid to like pull like the trigger and go like for the jugular. And then you know he's gonna. And what I've noticed with him is sometimes he'll be like he'll kind of play like this subtle victim and then and the one thing he said was like he he made a remark about john's late mom and i was like man it's like don't do that man and then he's like oh well you went after my parents who are alive my father there's a big difference in going after john jones and then going after the family and that's what like i, I know we're not fans i don't really like the trash talking i know it's part of the show but Izzy just really entered into dangerous waters here you do not ever make remarks about someone's late parents uh, as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I enjoy the trash talking and I think it's great. I think it's part of the sport, but it's, it's, it needs to be kept in the confines of the sport itself. I don't think there is a need. I mean, you can talk about each other's clothes and hairstyles, yeah. and, uh, but when it comes to family, I don't think uh, that people should broach that subject because neither of them know each other that well to know about sort of like each other's respective families. Uh, to make those comments because I'm pretty sure they're making them on the basis of what they've heard. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, trash talk, let's stick to the two individuals concerned and let's talk about their sporting accomplishments and say, you know, you know, you fought that guy and he was rubbish and, you know, I could have beaten him in one leg or whatever the case may be, fine. But, you know, uh, in the same way, Connor, I think he went too far yeah. with the trash talking against Khabib. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, it's not something I can, something I condone really. It's, uh, yeah, stick to the two individual, you know, talk about each other's fighting styles and, 
and so forth. And I think that's where it should stop, really. Yeah. That that's what I think. I just think Izzy will get hurt. Like I think John is going to use his wrestling. And everyone said when John wrestles, it's like you think he's not that heavy, but he's really like a specimen. Like it's like he just. I mean, as I said, in terms of Izzy, uh, you know, he can go on to become you know a great, great, great fighter type of thing. So. There is no reason why he can't. He's, he's you know, uh, showing the hunger. He's, 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 you know, he wants to get better. He wants to, uh, you know, uh, achieve his goals. And, yeah, I mean, good luck to him. Uh, but <clears throat> talking about now, I can't see him beating Don Jones. Uh, you know, it's just come, uh, you know that's, that's just my opinion. Maybe, he, maybe he can go out there and do it. Who knows? But in terms of what I've seen and... Uh, between the two, you know, I think that Jones has sort of like more artillery than uh, the Israel at the moment. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, no, I, I, I can't see that. I love how you said artillery because John is like a strategist when he's playing chess while his opponent plays checkers and he looks at it like he's a field commander. He's like, oh, your, putt, your, your good arm, your jab arm. That's one of your supply lines. I'm going to neutralize that. Oh, exactly. I'm going exactly. to leg kick. The, I'm going to leg. I will leg kick your uh, front leg so you don't have, so you cannot give me the front kick, leg as counter. Another supply line. It's like, it's really like an army strategist getting, neutralizing all the enemy supply routes until they're left like with nothing left. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as I said, that's what I was saying earlier in that uh, technique and, and, and hence the reason why, why are people like, you know, so like, the young ones coming up, people like uh, Darren's and Wesley, it's, it's about technique, you know, so like, you know, making an individual miss and, and, and trying to catch them out, setting them up for the technique, not, not just throw a combination in the hope that you're going to catch him. You know, I was told one, two, and I throw the kick afterwards. Well, don't throw that kick unless there's an opening. Don't throw it for the sake of throwing it, you know, set the person up, make sure that you can, that you have, a good chance of catching the individual, but you tend to find people sometimes fighting and thinking that's the combination I've been told, and I'm going to throw you no matter what, you know, whether the person is there or not. Uh, but no, you have to make certain adjustments in the fight itself. It's not about what you learned in your dojo. When you come in, things may change, and you have to be able to adapt. And for me, that's the mark of of a good fighter. So uh, by looking at people who can sort of like change and adapt to the situation. I'm fighting too much of a bigger guy. Why should I stand toe to toe against them? I'm gonna move. I'm fighting somebody who's technically good. Okay, fine. How do I cope with that? Uh, you know, I'm fighting somebody who's got a tremendous left hand or a tremendous left kick. You know, I'm gonna be watching out for that all the time. So you have to change. You know, it's like people go, how many, how many fighters are, uh, so has like, somebody like Krokop knocked out with his left leg? Uh, 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 in sort of like in, in, in K1, you know, and you know, everybody knows in the circle that he's got a tremendous left leg kick. So, no matter what you do, you gotta watch out for that left leg, you know. So, and and sometimes people go into fights, and, and afterwards they say, Oh, yeah, I knew that you know, he's, he's got that good technique, but I didn't think he's, he's gonna throw it then. But no, 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 you should know it, that's his favorite technique you know it's going to throw it. So every single time you attempt to do something or every single time you do something, you have to be wary. That's his favorite technique. He's going to throw that shot. Uh, so you need to be wary of that. Uh, so they said fighters who go out there and are able to assess the strengths and weaknesses of other fighters, you know, for me, uh, are the fighters I, I sort of like I aspire to. Uh, so, yeah, so... The guys I mentioned, <clears throat> none of them were sort of like power shot fighters. You know, it was more to do with technique. You know, the Michael Thompsons, the Andy Hug on her toes, you know, the Nick DeCostas, the sort of like, you know, uh, uh, the Lloyd Paynes, they, you know, they're just, you know, technique, 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 you know. And, and for me, that's where we should be teaching our students is improving their technical ability. Uh, uh, more so than you know, just sheer strength, you know, uh, because you know you can't go into a my thinking that I'm stronger than the other person. 
you know, I'd rather go into a man and say I'm technically better than the other guy. So I can neutralize his power. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it, you know? So hence the reason why I, I liked fighting guys who are bigger than me because I said to myself, well, he's slower. So why would I need to worry? Uh, but if I'm finding somebody who's quick, you can hit me and move and I'm going to be missing him all the time, then they're the kind of fight I worry about. Uh, but, you know, as I said, somebody's got the power. That's the least of my concerns. That's awesome. Now, you know, um, you've also been to Canada. You know, you've done tournaments in Canada. So shout out to Shian Geta and Sove for uh, giving me the footage. Um, and he also, now, you've, when you've been to Canada, there was Geta and Sove who had his fighters such as Julie Nadeau, Jerry Marketos, and Michael Zimmerman, who I consider the North American lightweight greatest of all time. Yes, yes. I mean, as I said, I mean, we had... We had an amazing, amazing time in in, uh, in Canada when we went. I'm trying to remember the um, the Sheehan at the time uh, when we went over there. Gautier, yeah. was it Dan Gautier? Sheehan Gautier, Gautier, that's it. Is he around still? I don't know. I only know him by name. I don't know uh, much, but I have to ask around. Yes, yeah, yeah, Sheehan Gautier. Uh, you know, he, he just... What a humble guy! I mean, he he, he sort of like he showed us a great time, uh, and um, yeah, yeah, we had we had, I mean, most of the countries that we went to fight, we had an amazing time. You know, win or lose, the experience is invaluable, and you now we stay with me until I die. It was just an incredible experience in all the countries, um, and and uh, the countries were more important than all the friends that you make. Uh, throughout that journey because somebody always adds something to your repertoire whether uh, 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 is through a session or through conversation uh, you know you always take home something from all the trips uh, from all the fights and from all the conversation there's always something there for you type of thing so yeah I'm, I'm sort of blessed to have been able to uh, to travel and, 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 and compete and make so many friends around the world. It's been an incredible journey, for sure. It really has. And, you know, taking it away from martial arts, you've also now, so, you know, you're still teaching, but you're also a devoted father, like, you know, of two very successful young men and your sons. How, what does it mean? What, like, how, is, how do you feel becoming a father has impacted you, not only in your life, but around your peers, whether it's in career, uh, martial arts, and work and just in general life? Oh, I've got three kids. I've got two boys and, and, and my daughter. Oh, uh, I stand it corrected. <laughs> yeah, so I've got, I've got three. Uh, there is no greater things, really. There, there is no, no greater joy in life than, than, than having your kids. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I live, I, I essentially live for, you know, uh, uh, for my kids. It's, 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 it's the greatest honor, uh, uh, you know, to see them born and 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 see them grow. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I will die happy, you know, seeing that I've got these three amazing individual back and call so like mine type of thing. So no matter what they choose to do in their lives, uh, you know, them being healthy uh, and stand up kids. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't, I can't, there is nothing that can beat that, you know, it, 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 if I have to give everything, you know, uh, for my children, I would do that in a heartbeat. Uh, it's it's an, an incredible sort of like uh, a feeling, you know, to not to hear that word dad, you know, from, from, from your kids. Uh, yeah, yeah, can't, can't, there's no comparison, no comparison at all. That's awesome, man. That's I'm really happy to hear that. And you know, like that, it's really helped you become like a better person in all aspects of your life. And it really does change parenthood changes you because I have a stepbrother who's got th four kids. He's got three daughters and now a son. And it just changes everything. Like you just see the world differently when you have kids. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, you know, uh, prior to having the kids, I was, you know, I've always loved fighting. Um, you know. Um, you know, I've had uh, a security company myself for uh, for a number of years, and I was introduced to security by by uh, uh, by Sensei Joe Borg, uh, who was one of my teachers. 
uh, and then you know, I, so I went on to uh, uh, to run a security company for quite some time, uh, which I'm no longer. I've gone back to the office because of the pandemic. I've had to change jobs and stuck back in an office now. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, no, I mean it's it's. God, I'm just trying to think. Um, I've, I've, I've. I wouldn't say it's made me more mellow, but I have to think twice before I do something because I have that responsibility. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> you know, having kids makes you do that. You know, whereas before, you know, uh, you know, I've brought up in an era where, where we challenged, you know, fighters from different dojos or different organization. What made the British Open at Crystal Palace so uh, such a major event is because we had many different styles fighting in the same tournament because, you know, Kyokushin tournaments are open tournaments. So you had Kung Fu, you had kickboxers, Thai boxers, anybody could fight in the tournament. And that's what made that event. So part of our training, uh, 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 you know, we used to go and challenge, like, fight against Thai boxers or kickboxers or of anybody type of thing. Uh, or I wouldn't think twice about getting involved in street fights. Uh, you know, I wouldn't think twice because I had no responsibility. It was just me. Uh, but obviously, when you have kids... You think twice. <laughs> you think twice before you do anything whatsoever at all. And you're thinking, no, 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 I've got to be careful here. I go, you know, mass to feed. Uh, you know, I've got to show the right example. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's just an incredible, an incredible feeling to have, you know, your, your children. So, yeah. That's amazing. That's, really well. that's amazing. Now, also, so you, you said you have a security company. And uh, with that, now you've been security to some of some pretty big names. You know, you've probably met if you probably had the privilege of like, you know, with all the work you've done, you know, like to like be uh, like a security guard for people. Um, is it okay if I ask like, who are some of those names? Because like, I'm just curious because I, I, you're, you're, you're just such a good storyteller. It was it's quite funny you mentioned that because I had one of the guys that used to work for me on the phone. Uh, and uh, and we were just talking about uh, Eminem. Now, when Eminem first came to uh, to London, uh, I think he was, I would say, probably like in the uh, mid two thousand mm -hmm. or two thousand and two. I think he was and stuff like that. Um, I took him out for a walk uh, in London. He came, he came he came to London with uh, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Dog. And then, wow. then, yeah, so he, he just, you know, he wanted to walk around uh, with his girlfriend at the time. He wasn't married. And, and yes, yeah, so I, I took him for a little walk around, uh, around London. Nobody knew who he was uh, because I think, he, yeah, he wasn't launched in the UK. I think he was a star or a star in the making in America, but not so much launched in the UK. And, uh, and I was working in, in a nightclub and that was used as... So the center uh, uh, for his uh, sort of advertising and marketing. And uh, yeah, so I was assigned to, to take him for a walk. And yeah, we went out for a walk for about an hour or so uh, in London. Uh, I've met uh, Beyonce when she was uh, part of the... Uh, Destiny's Child. Destiny, Destiny's Child. Uh, I was head of security of a nightclub in, uh, in London, in Vauxhall. And uh, there was a promotion called uh, "To Us Is Nice," uh, which was one of the, the biggest promotions in, in uh, sort of like in <clears throat> in London at the time. And uh, and they turned up, and I wouldn't let them in because the club was full. But more importantly, I didn't know who Destiny Charles was. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so I. I I didn't. I, I didn't know who they were. So I said, "Does anybody know? Des has anybody heard of Destiny Child?" And everybody was screaming. It was like, "Yeah!" And I said, "Who are they?" And I said, "This song." I went, "Oh, they're the ones who sing this song." <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can come in. Um, yeah, I mean, through security, you meet so many people. I mean, I 
uh, looked after Mike Tyson when he came over to London. No uh, way. Oh, my yeah. God. That is <laughs> – what was that like, man? That was, oh, yeah, was wild. Oh, incredible, my – Incredible, incredible uh, uh, when he came as, you know, uh, such a nice individual and so knowledgeable, which a lot of people uh, sort of don't get the opportunity to see, uh, uh, presumably on, sort of, you know, where you meet him or – or maybe just reporting on the fight and stuff like that. But it's so knowledgeable about the sport. Uh, and, and once again, a very humble uh, individual as well. Uh, I, I used to look after um, uh, the famous fighter. It was also who became uh, the world heavyweight champion, Frank Bruno. Oh, my uh, God. That's insane. Frank Bruno. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, so I, I I used to look after him as I say, once again. I mean, he's an incredible individual, uh, really, really incredible individual. Um, humble, um, nice. Um, as I said, hasn't forgotten where he came from, and and generosity beyond belief. Uh, yes, and uh, and a shout out to. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to uh, oh gosh, I'm almost I forgot his name now. Uh, there's a chap called Cass Pennant. Um, Cass is, is is a well-known individual in sort of in the British and uh, folklore type of thing. If you were to search his name, uh, but him and I, he's the one who introduced me to look after Frank Bruno. And uh, yeah, we had an an amazing individual. Frank turned up on a wedding. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, uh, lovely individual. In terms of stars, uh, oh gosh, there's so many. We looked after Justin Bieber. Oh, can I throw some names at you and you'll tell me if you say, can I give you, <laughs> I'll give you some names and you'll tell me yes or no, okay? So Dolph Lundgren, Michael Jai White, Jean Claude Van Damme, uh, Steven Seagal. No, no. Uh, but I mean, Dolph, I mean, his name is his real name is Hans Lundgren. I mean, Hans used to fight with us at, at the British Open, so you know, his real name is Hans Lundgren, yeah. uh, before he became Dolph. So, uh, we met him in karate circles, um, did meet him when he became Dolph as well. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, he was, you know, um, once again, another individual who's you know, extremely humble. Um, I used to train in the gym with uh, Jason Statham, the, uh, the actor. Oh, my god. Uh, yeah, he, you know, the gym where I was training, and he didn't live far, far from there, so he used to come. Another very humble, I mean, you know, humble beyond humble. Jason Statham is, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, gosh. Uh, who else do we, who else do I, we looked after? Uh, uh, just footballers, like English footballers, some of them uh, that we used to meet, we used to come to the club. Uh, what I used to be at. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when you work in the security industry, uh, you know, you're likely to meet all these people. Um, uh, what's his name? What's, what's the actor you, you mentioned? No Michael J. White, no Jean Claude Van Damme. Steven Seagal. No Steven Seagal, no. Um, we were just talking about him a couple of days ago and I forgot his name and I had to Google his name. Uh, Wesley Snipes. Oh, yes. Oh, my. Oh, that is. <laughs> I still watch that Blade One intro Blade. to this day. <laughs> yeah, Wesley. Wesley also came to the club. Uh, yeah, yeah. as I said, you know, when you work in that environment, the likelihood is, you know, you're going to meet this, uh, these people around uh, and the clubs, and, and especially clubs where uh, uh, sort of like they're holding um, very sort of like famous promotions. So the likelihood is that you know, you're going to meet all these stars. Uh, but yeah, my, my encounter with every single one of them has been great. Uh, no, no issues at all. So yeah, blessed. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. So um, obviously, you know, with MMA too, we were talking about John Jones and whatnot. Yeah. 2021 has gotten off to such a fire start we had max holloway cater we had connor's return we had uh last night overeem and volkov volkov yeah just, just uh, actually watched that fight this morning the overeem and volkov one uh i, th I, th I think overeem is slowing down it's, it's not it's, it's not 
the same over him. Mm -hmm. he, he looked a bit lacklustre in, uh, in that fight, that type of thing. So, uh, you know, but that, that is not to say that he should retire. Um, but he, he didn't look, you know, the old over him. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. There is but that. Yeah. Welcome is a beast, though. <laughs> yeah, student of uh, Max Dedek, uh, who's uh, another one of the legends in Russian Legend, yes, yeah, no, yeah, Max Dedek, yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, Russia is producing so many tremendous fighters for the past, I'll say, I'll 15, 15 years or so, 20 years. I would say it was when Yeltsin left because the way I look at when Russia's entry into like mainstream sports and the globalized scale was when communism ended in 1991, the Russians were coming in for yes, ice yeah. hockey. But Kyokushin, it was kind of like, well, we don't really know about them. But then luckily when Yeltsin came in, I think from what I understand, Hanshi Arniel was very smart to get in there while it was under turbulence, despite of the challenges, I imagine. Yeah. He was able to do those early tournaments. But it was when Putin came in in the year 2000, that's when I feel slowly the Russians started to really become yeah, a powerhouse. Yeah, because he's, he's, you know, he's, he's an avid sort of like a sports enthusiast, Putin is, and, you know, with his judo background as well type of thing so yeah he, he certainly elevated the sport and uh, yeah and they are certainly showing about producing you know, tremendous talent you know in russia you know you can't and not just russia i mean uh, you know the, the former eastern bloc uh if you talk about you know poland bulgaria uh, uh and hungary all those countries are producing tremendous fighters you know uh croatia you know so yeah uh, Romania, Czechoslovakia. Romania, Czechoslovakia. Yeah, they're all producing, you know, incredible fighters. It's, it's insane. And uh, but for him, and then we bring it back to him because like, we just went off in an off shooting. That's, yeah. That's what I love about I knew, I knew when like, like Darren and I were talking and when before like I, I introduced myself to you, he's like, you're going to love Felix. He's like, you're never going to become that <laughs> right away. Knowing, and Darren doesn't, and, Darren, and, and Darren's usually very humble, but like he was like saying with emojis, he's like, you're going to like him. He's like, you and him are going to like each other. So yeah, kudos to Darren for that. Um, another fight that's coming up, we have Usman versus Burns, a very underrated yep. fight. Um, I think if Kamaru wins this, you know, I, I just see Kamaru as like the eventual goat of the welterweight division because I think so too. I yeah. think so too. You know, he prepares himself himself methodically. Um, he's, he's, you know, his attention to detail. You know, as I said, that calculating mind that you can see that when he goes into the octagon, that he's looking at his opponent and he's looking at weaknesses, uh, and 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 that's why I admire about the guy. You know, he's resolute in his plan you know he looks at the individual and and i'm going to come up with something to beat you uh you know and no matter what you throw at me i will have an answer for you so uh, yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a firestorm of a year for sure oh, man and then we have in march we have the three title fights yan versus aljo anderson sure, yeah. versus Nunes, and then Izzy versus Yan, and then at the end of March we have Stipe versus Francis too, and Volkanovski and Brian Ortega. I'm so excited for that Stipe. Uh, Stipe against the Francis, yes, indeed, my my countryman, Francis Ngannou. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I, th I think once again, and I think his failure last time was his failure to prepare. He looked at what he can do, as opposed to looking at his opponent. And I think this time round, he will recognize his opponent's strength and come slightly better prepared. Uh, because before he was relying on his sheer power, he was like, you know, I'm going to connect, I'm going to connect, I'm going to connect. Uh, but when it, when he just rely on that, Stipe brought more to the table. Yeah. And by then, Francis was exhausted. <laughs> he was exhausted. So I'm hoping that now that he's seen or Steve can bring to the table. Uh, his cardio is phenomenal for a heavyweight. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and Angano is not going to rely entirely uh, on his power that he needs to add to his repertoire uh, in order to, uh, to compete. And, uh, and I think it's going to be a close fight. I have Francis winning it. I think Stipe is very damaged from those DC wars. The inactivity too from the heavyweight champion does not help. Um, what do you think a win does for African mixed martial arts if Francis wins that heavyweight title? Uh, 
we have great potential and, and I think what, what we lack in Africa is one is the exposure uh, and I think if we had the facilities uh, uh, um, and, and the exposure, I think you will see tremendous amount of fighters uh, coming through uh, from Africa in general. Um, you know, because like, you know, you know, from what I've seen and, and heard from uh, talking to different uh, friends who are in Africa type of thing, the talent that some of them demonstrate, they just need to be guided the right way. So in terms of whether it's nutrition or, or training practices, um, you know, because sometimes like you're doing things that are detrimental to your physical being, but without somebody pointing it out to you, you continue doing that and that essentially shortens your sporting life, essentially. Uh, so I think if, 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 if we get greater exposure, but more importantly, an investment as well in, in, in the infrastructure uh, uh, for sort of the African fighters in general, not just uh, Southern Africans, but, you know, uh, 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 Northern Africans as well, you know, because all you see from Africa is you, you got people like in the K1, you got Badahari, for example. But the exposure, yeah, but the exposure came because through Holland. Uh, and then he made sort of... Uh, and Morocco famous, if you see what I mean. Uh, but whereas, like, if you went to Africa, if you, if you saw the talent, I mean, I, I've been to South Africa on a, on a few occasions, and the talent I see over there is just incredible. It really, really is, you know. Uh, sort of like the, the willingness to learn is there. Uh, uh, you know, wanting, wanting to, to do better, but a lot of them lack, as I said, the infrastructure is not there and, and sort of like the financial support for them to train, for example, just, just, just to have the facilities you know, to train, uh, you know, it's, it's not available for, for, for a lot of them. So until that happens, uh, you know, we won't see that many, only those who escape because Francis, for example, you know, became famous through France, you know, it wasn't directly through Cameroon. Uh, so he had to go to France first and establish himself there before he became successful on the world stage. Uh, so if we get that infrastructure back home, like, you know, in, in Africa, you'll see some amazing talent coming through, you know? So yeah, that's what we need. I could not agree more. Guys like Francis, Kamaru Usman, who's gone back, and even Israel. I think those three are like the, the ambassadors for what African mixed martial arts is or combat yeah. sports right now. Oh, yes, yes. So in terms of ability, but there's, there's even, um, I forgot his name. Uh, there's a Cameroonian guy who fights Thai boxing. And I think he's also fought in, uh, 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 in the UFC, I believe. In Ga I forgot his name. Uh, but the there's a few, there's a few, but once again, they're not uh, sort of like coming directly from an African country. Uh, they're going through uh, as either a European or sort of like, you know, a North American, like you got Easy, for example, coming through New Zealand before he made it to the world stage. Uh, but, you know, hardly any sort of African fighter has come directly from an African state and sort of like compete uh, and, and get that exposure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, those three you mentioned are, would be wonderful ambassadors and, and who knows, maybe through, uh, uh, through them, you know, we'll see maybe a little bit of investment back home and, and give the opportunity to these young kids who are, you know, who, you know, amazing talent, amazing talent. And uh, yeah, and, and I'm pretty sure, given so sort of like, so sort of the right coaching and the right facilities, you'll see quite a few excelling as well, yeah. Awesome, that's awesome, I really like that. So uh, Felix, where can people connect with you on social media if they ever wanna like talk karate or like, you know, martial arts or anything else? Cause like you, you, you're very like, you're one of like, you're such like a brilliant mind. Like I've, I think I've taken away like, like 20 different things and I've now I just got to apply them to my, <laughs> but yeah, I want to make sure people connect with you and we can help you blow up because you deserve so much appreciation and credibility for what you've done. 
social media. I mean, just, just my Facebook. Um, you know, the, the things I'm not, I'm not a great person on any of those platforms at all. <laughs> you know, I, I, I occasionally I have to get my daughter to say, darling, how do you send a link on Facebook? Because I haven't got a clue how you do this. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I am on Facebook. Uh, I am on, on Instagram through the BKK, I believe. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, if, if they go on, onto the, uh, the BKK, the British Karate Kyokushinkai website, because uh, currently I'm, I'm, I'm the chairman of the British Karate Organization at the moment. So if you were to go on the BKK website as well, uh, my details are on there, my telephone number, my email address. Um, yeah, and, and as I said, I'm, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, just add me as a friend, and if you have any question, I'll endeavor to answer. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. You know, yeah. Awesome. Well, once again, I really was a pleasure to finally host you. I'm so happy we got to do this on a Sunday. Um, and, you know, you ever want to come back on, the door is always open because I could talk to you for days. Maybe someday, like, I'll have you back. Yeah, one day soon I'll have you back on. Okay, it's Sunday stories with, uh, yeah. with Shian Felix <laughs> uh, Tumaza. That's it. <laughs> that would be a podcast for the future indeed. <laughs> Who knows? Yes. Yeah, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me and uh, to all the practitioners out there, Kyokushin or Nyo Kyokushin, uh, carry on some of the hard work that you're doing. Uh, it's, 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 it's wonderful to see so many people involved in martial arts. Uh, and uh, yeah, and just continue spreading the word, continue training and, uh, and stay safe. You know, it's a pandemic at the moment, so do be careful. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully soon things will return back to normal. And then hopefully we'll see each other uh, sort of like, you know, face to face as opposed to uh, this lovely sort of like media platforms that we see each other on these days. Exactly. So, yeah, but thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. It's my pleasure, man. Thank you for coming on. So the episode You're will welcome. be on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, all audio platforms. So when it's up, please like, share, subscribe. We got to raise the bar in all martial arts, whether it's Kyokushin, BJJ, K1, karate, kickboxing, you name it. Could not agree more. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.